Ladies and gentlemen, Marc-André Lemberg, give him a big hand. So thanks again for the, for the very nice intro. It's going to be hard to live up to that. Right, so I'm going to talk about a project that we did uh, end of last year. I'm Mark Lemberg. Uh, I've been around in, in the Python community for, for lots and lots of years. Uh, I'm also one of the Euro Python organizers. The rest you can read here. It's not that important. Um, so this is the agenda for the talk. Quite a few slides. I hope I can uh, show all of them. So what, what's, what was the outset of this, this project? Um, we were asked last year, we were asked by, a, let's say, a big company, because I can't give any details. I signed an NDA for this. Uh, a, so a big company wanted to smile, a small company doing Python development internally. And uh, they wanted to know how much their Python code was actually worth. So what the value was of, of the IT that they had. And because they didn't have any IT skills uh, in term for specifically for Python internally, because they're mostly a Java uh, company, they uh, asked us to help them. And so uh, we had very little time to do this. We just had two or three weeks to actually run the whole project. From, so we basically, we knew nothing about valuation of uh, companies. And we had to come up with a few things. And we, we thought that might be a good idea to try a few different models and then maybe do some averages and then maybe do some calculation and uh, come up with some value that we give them. And they liked that, and so we did that. So. Uh, First, a disclaimer, the stuff that I'm talking about here, I'm not an expert in. Uh, we basically just kind of did some research, shows uh, some, some different methods, some dif different tools to use, and then went, went uh, ahead with it and mixed all that with, with our experience in running these projects. So what do you have to do if you want to assign a value to, a, to an IT startup? Well, first of all, you have the, the business value. That is something that I'm not going to talk about because the company did that themselves. They had experts for that. Uh, plus, of course, if it's IT-focused, then you have the IT value of the company, and that's where we came in. So both uh, sides, of course, have risks. And so uh, you need to address those risks when you, when you value the company. Uh, again, the business side we did not really participate much in, but what we did do is we uh, when we looked at the code base that they had created and the way that they had, they had set up their systems, we found a few issues with that that were uh, also going, for example, into the area of data security or maybe uh, patent, patents and then trademark infringement. And those are, were things that we basically told the business side of, of the company to, to uh, take into account and uh, take that risk into account. And then we came in to then uh, judge the, the IT risks that they had. So this is just a list of IT risks that you usually find in, in, in uh, larger projects. And so we had to look at, at the IT side of this, this valuation process. So this is what we, what we set out to do, and we told the company that they were fine with doing that. So first we sat down with the team, we tried to analyze the team, we tried to figure out whether the developers were any good, whether the system was any good, whether the data that they had was any good, uh, and it turned out to be very good. And then, of course, we wanted to add some scientific approach to this, so we, uh, of course, we uh, used Wikipedia and then <laughs> searched a bit around for possible ways of doing valuation. We found this Kokomo model, which seems to be a standard in the industry for doing these kinds of things. Of course, it's based on C, C++, and Java. It's not based on Python, and we uh, found out about that um, later on in the process. And as second model, we used an effort model, which is basically, well, I'm going to talk about it later on. Anyway, and then you, ha you get some basic value for the, for the whole thing, and then you apply some, some soft values, or you remove some soft values if you find risks, for example, uh, from, the, from the value that you get. And we call this, uh, we call this added value. And then, you get one final value, which is kind of the estimate based on models, and then you, you go ahead and then you try to figure out what would it cost to rebuild this whole thing from scratch, and you give a value for that. And then in the end, the company has to decide whether to either buy the company and then maybe run with that company, or maybe uh, instead use the approach of building everything themselves, which might actually be cheaper. 
So let's look at the analysis part. <clears throat> As I said, we have quite a few soft factors. We have some factors that we can actually measure. So you have code metrics. And you always have to take into account that you cannot possibly look at everything in that short time frame. So you have to build in some risk buffer for inaccuracies that you know you're going to have in your estimate. And so for the first thing, we just sat down with the team. We discussed everything. We tried to figure out as much as possible from them. We had, we had a, um, a list of questions, something like 200 questions for them to, to answer. We went through that in a meeting for a complete day and uh, got all the information from them. Uh, and that's also how we f found out about things that were like risks, for example, that they had not really uh, addressed yet that would have, uh, would, that the, the, the big company buying the small company would have to address in that small company in order to fit their own corporate uh, standards. Um, and then we had to check the code. That was fairly easy because there are tools for this. And then again, you have you throw in some experience to, to measure the the risk buffer that you have to add to this. So let's have a look at how you can measure the code metrics. There's this nice Python tool called Radon, which uh, you just throw at your Python code and it just runs uh, through the whole repository that you have and it then takes all the, the different uh, details from that code and, and gives you nice summary reports and uh, outputs all the, the stuff that you need to know about. I think I just skipped the slide. Yeah. So the standard terms that you uh, have in, in code metrics are, of course, lines of code, then source lines of code, which is basically just lines of code without the, uh, the comments and the uh, doc strings. Logical lines of code is something special. It's actually just code that gets executed. So, for example, if you have a, a, a for statement, then um, the, the, uh, the for line itself is not necessarily executed. It's just that the, the inner uh, loop is executed and so you just count those lines. <coughs> then you have blank lines of course and especially important in Python because blank lines are white space and we love white space, right? So the, the more white space the better, the better you can read the code. You also have to look at, at lines of code per module and then can use that as basis for how maintainable that code is <coughs> from just looking at these numbers. So the, the more lines of code you have per module, the more classes and methods and everything you have per, per module, then it, the harder it usually gets to maintain that code. And it's usually better to break modules in smaller pieces and then do it that way. So Radon helps with this. Uh, it also helps with figuring out whether you have enough inline documentation, which uh, I find very important to have in, in, in a code base. I very often get to see code written by, by companies that don't have a lot of inline documentation, and so basically all the documentation about the code itself is either somewhere else or it's just nowhere, so it doesn't exist. Um, so having doc strings and inline uh, comments is always a good thing, so they get, uh, they get a plus added value for that if, if they're going to show this. So in, in, in this particular case, it was kind of average, um, not, that, not really that good. Um, then you have two measurements that um, that take all this data and then also add some extra information from the code base so they actually parse the code and then try to figure out how many decision nodes you have in your, in your execution tree. So for example, an, an if statement would be a decision node and the more decision nodes you have per, per function then the higher the complexity and so higher values are worse so you get more complexity and lower values are better. Uh, it's similar with the maintainability index except that it's the other way around. So, uh, the maintainability index takes the complexity, the density, the lines of code and everything, puts everything together into a nice huge formula and gives you this index and you get higher values for better maintainability. Again, you can use Radon for this. So this is what we used as part of the input for the evaluation. <coughs> then we had a look at the test coverage. So we had them uh, give us all the output of the coverage.py. We also check for end-to-end -end tests, which are very important. So those are things that you usually don't cover with unit tests. So you actually have someone sitting there, or maybe you have Selenium sitting there, uh, and entering your, the stuff into your, into your web application, and you check whether the end results, so let's say the report that you get out of it later on, actually matches what you expect. Um, those are very important to have. Um, in this case, they did have a few, not that much, so that was a bummer. Um, then we also 
checked for randomized tests because we found in other projects that if you don't do use randomized tests, you often end up with test cases that are biased towards one particular area in your code. And so even though you have 100% test coverage, you're not actually testing 100% of what the possible uh, entry data could look like. So you think everything is correct, but it's not necessary. So. Right, so that's what you can do in terms of code metrics, so by just looking at numbers. Next was this Kokomo model that we basically read up on uh, Wikipedia. So uh, this is it's a very old model. It's, I think it's from the 70s or 80s. Um, it's, it's used to, to assign a value to a, uh, or to give an estimate for how much time you'd have to spend to write code. The only parameter you enter is basically lines of code. And then you have to choose one of these models. Of course, nowadays most projects are organic projects uh, in the sense of Kokomo. So you have uh, small teams, agile process, and uh, so there's nothing much to decide there. Then you get these very simple formulas here with a few parameters, the small a, b, c, d are parameters. Uh, those are predefined by the model, so you just look them up on Wikipedia. Uh, use them for that particular organic project category that you want to use, and then you have to use this adjustment factor to accommodate for the efficiency of different languages. And what we found is that Wikipedia recommends 0 0.9 to 1.4 for Java and C. Well, the numbers that came out of this did not really match reality, so uh, we had to use a different factor. So we used 0.5 for this, which kind of indicates as that's sort of like a side result from this whole thing that Python is, in fact, more efficient than Java and C. As if we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, so what you then get, you get uh, development time, and then you have to look at your development team, the number of senior developers and regular developers that you want to put on that team, the, the, uh, how much money you have to spend for them, and then you get the value, and that's your, your uh, estimate. And you do the same thing for the effort model, except that you don't use some formula for this. You sit down with the project manager of that particular product and ask them, uh, ask the company how much time they took to, to write this thing, how many developers they used, and what problems they had, and then you use that as input for this formula and you get the similar value. Right. So. Next comes the, the magic part, which is added value. So you have these numbers, and then you go through this list of soft factors that you have, and you, you add some percentage, or you, you remove some percentage from the value, depending on what you think is good quality work or good quality design, uh, and you factor in risks, extensibility, maintainability, uh, various uh, costs that you, you uh, see in, the, in, that, in that questionnaire that you did. You add the risk buffer and in the end you come up with um, something that you can actually use in your calculation. So you take those two models. We just took a pragmatic approach because we didn't know better. Uh, so we used Kokomo model, the, the value that came out of that. We used the effort model and just uh, used the average. Uh, then we added the the value, the added value factor in, in, in that particular case came out to something like 75% more than what the, um, the value from the models was, uh, which is a good sign, by the way. I mean, they really did a good job there. And then you come up with a final estimate. Right, and then in that particular case, they also had valuable data in that company, which is something that you not necessarily have in, in startups, but I mean, if a startup has worked for if a number of years, then they have usually gathered some data, and you need to assign a value to that as well. Now, for that, we had not found any good model, like the Kokomo one, to use, so that we can, could just use the effort model. So we basically sat down with them again, tried to figure out how much time it took them, how much they had to pay for those experts to, to uh, gather that data, and then we had an estimate as well, and we added everything together, and then we had a final value to give to the big company to then use as estimate. Now, the next question was make or buy. For doing that, you have to basically try to create a new company that does exactly the same thing. I mean, I'm just leaving aside all the patent and infringement and stuff. Uh, just, I mean, big company, you know, and small company, so big company can do this. Small company, usually can't, so. <laughs> 
So what you have to address, you have to recreate all the products, all the data. You have to get the experts in, which is usually one of the most difficult parts. And then, of course, you have to work and get the same market share in order to be able to compare those two companies. So all this costs, and especially the marketing and stuff that costs a lot. So that's a business side, so we did not do that. So we just focused on the IT side. And so you need to see how much, how much money you would have to put in as, let's say, you're a software shop like we are, how much effort you would have to put in to basically rebuild everything that they did. And you'd also, also have to uh, then look at how to recreate the data, which is not necessarily something that you do as a software shop, but at least you have to provide some advice on how to do this. And then you have an offer for rebuilding everything, and then you put everything together, give it to them, and they decide. And in this case, they decided not to buy. So for them, the analysis was uh, maybe not exactly what they wanted, <laughs> but I think in the end, it's, uh, it's, it, it, the, the outcome was good for everyone. So how can you add value to your startup? Well, basically, it's just all I've just said, and you work on all these different factors uh, and improve them. And it's not really that hard. I mean, you just write, you need to write good code. It has, needs to have a good structure. Complexibil the complexity should be low. The structure should be right. So you better to use more modules than larger ones. Uh, you, would, you need to have everything as flexible as possible when you design the, the whole product. It needs to be extensible because uh, usually you want to, the big company wants to enter new markets, which the small company has not thought about. So you need to be flexible at that end. Um, and then, of course, you need to invest into things like data structures, like algorithms. For example, you can, for the algorithms, you can have lots of books from CS you can use. You don't have to always have to use the, the naive uh, algorithms for everything, which many companies do. Plus, there's one important thing on the IT side. It's for reducing risks by not depending too much on third party packages because you don't have that much control over them even though they might be very high quality. If your company is not capable of, of maintaining uh, such a third party package in case, for example, the author just goes away uh, or does something else or, uh, I don't know, the, the, the project stops, then uh, you have a huge risk there. Right, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any questions? I've got loads of questions, so I hope you have the same ones that I have in my head, because that'll help. There you go. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask about, um, about this Radon tool, or this automatic um, check on, on the code quality. Uh, isn't there usually the danger that that you can play a game with it, that you optimize for the tool and not for actual better code. How reliable is this radon? If, if somebody tells me, oh, tomorrow there will be due diligence, just do some makeup to the code so that the tool gives a better value, is that possible? Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure it, it is possible, yes, but the company in that case did not know about this tool and we gave it to them and said tomorrow we need the output, so they did not really have a chance of manipulating anything. So what, what we did in that case is we, we took the output of Radon, and of course you get for, for, it gives you the outputs per module, and then you look at the modules that look a bit like, say, have a high complexity or have a low maintainability, um, and then you just check those, check the code of those, and analyze why why the Radon tool uh, gives that readings afterwards. So, of course, you have to do some some code review as well as part of that. But we simply did not have time to read all the code base. So I mean, if you're given a code base that has a few hundred thousand lines of code, then there's no way to do it that fast. More questions? There you go. Uh, gentleman at the back on the right there has his arm. Hello. Um, so uh, did you look at any other alternatives to the Kokomo um, model, which seemed to use lines of code as, uh, as perhaps the starting point for, for measuring things? What other ways could you measure? What, what other signals from the code could you use to measure the, um, the, the value? 
the signals from code. Well, basically, what we did. You, you we were measuring lines of code, weren't you? That's how code. Yes, that's works. how the yeah, Kokomo okay. model works. So, and and the 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 value that we got out of Kokomo was so much higher than than uh, the the um, the value that we estimated and the value that we got out of the out of the effort model that we simply had to use a different factor for that. Right. Okay. It just it reminded me of uh, of a musical example where. Um, the BBC used to pay arrangers by bar, um, and that was just mm -hmm. an arbitrary measure. And so the arrangers figured this out very quickly that if they wrote everything in two four, they got twice as much money because there was twice as many bars. And so there's a way you could game this because if you understand what the the, the thing is that you're measuring, again, it's very similar to the question we just had before. You could game these things, but you answered that, I guess, um, when you said that you didn't tell them that you were coming. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, you, you look at the code and then you see these things, right? So, I mean, if you see that someone's, uh, I don't know, been, been adding lots and lots of uh, dummy lines to, to the code, then just to get more lines of code to make it look like more valuable, then, of course, you will detect that. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Harry. <laughs> Questions? Okay, Maybe sorry. Nice to hear you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, you mentioned the risk buffer in your talk. Yes. And uh, what value uh, is appropriate, in your opinion? This is hard to say. I mean, in our case, for example, we were not able to review all the code that they had. So we just had, we, we did not even have a chance to look at all the components that they had in their code. So we just looked at the main, the central kind of component that had all the, the interesting bits in it. But we did not look at all the other components that were uh, stuck on the side that did some UI stuff. So we knew that we were only covering, say, maybe 20% of, of what they actually wrote in their code. And based on those 20%, we kind of had to uh, interpolate then the, the rest, the quality of the rest. And so that's what we used uh, for the risk buffer. So the risk buffer was, was fairly uh, sizable in that case. So and uh, at what number did you? Uh, I can't tell you any number. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant, more questions. Yep, over there. Um, did you continue tracking the company to see whether your valuation was correct, or did you have any other way of knowing whether your valuation was correct or close to correct? Well, we, we know that the big company did not buy the small company and that they're thinking about actually doing it themselves. So they on, on the make or buy, they're actually more on the uh, make side. But they're still discussing that. Big companies take longer in these things. Uh, what was the effort of the reviewer? Like, did you spend weeks of tens of people or the days? No, no, no. We, had, um, we didn't have much time. We had something like um, two or three weeks, like I just said. And uh, so we had one, one full day meeting with them, asking all these questions, also doing the uh, part of the review. Because they did, of course they did not give us the source code, so we just had we had to sit there and then just uh, look at it, and so we did not have that much information from them, so we had to base everything on on, on uh, that kind of uh, input. More questions? Oh, okay. Which is not back. ideal just to to say it, but we simply I mean we we were told that we have to give them an answer, the big company an answer, uh, within those three weeks, and that that was all we had. So. We needed to come up with something that made sense, and, and so basically that's what we did. So, as I said in the beginning, this is not necessarily this is not a how you should do it, right? <laughs> this is just how we did it, and and it, the numbers that came out that did make sense. So, um, hi. So first, thanks for your talk. Um, from what I understand, you basically uh, evaluated a company based on their repository, which is. I would say interesting, uh, but I would also argue that perhaps the biggest weight uh, in the company evaluation is the developer team or the company structure, their processes uh, that were created out of uh, various needs and so on. So I would be interested in how did you approach uh, to measure these kinds of, uh, let's say, more soft things. Well, we, we did not have a look at the business side of things because we had a, a, a different part of the project doing that. So they had, the big, com big company had, had experts for doing these things, so analyzing their numbers and, and analyzing the team. All we could do is we could tell them whether we have the impression they have good developers or not, or good software designers, because that's our expertise. 
And so we were not, we're not experts on, on business processes, so we cannot really put a value to that. So what we did do is we told the, the business side what we think about their, their team skills, and we told them about the risks that we found in the, in the code base and in the structure of their uh, systems. Uh, but that was basically it about the business side of things. So, so it seems like the very common thread in both the talk and, and your answers is you were under a lot of pressure and you made certain decisions just based, basically because of that. Now, let's say you remove all the pressure. You have as long as you want, like the big company comes in and tells you, take as long as you want, have as many people as you want, do whatever you want with this. What would you have done differently? What would you have um, maybe not done or maybe um, done more thoroughly from the process? Well, I think we, we would have done more research on, on, on this whole valuation uh, uh, approach. Uh, I mean, we basically just had this Kokomo model, uh, which just came up on Wikipedia, and we used that. Um, there were also some people in the company who wanted to use that model, so they obviously found it and found it useful, so we kind of made sense to use that. We would have put more energy into that. We would have had more interviews with the team members. Uh, we would have done more code reviews. We would have had uh, access to the actual, all the systems, all the components, so not just looking at a part of it. Um, then, I mean, basically talking to people is, is, is very valuable. We did not have time for that. We just talked to the, to the chief developers, um, not the, like the regular developers that they had. Um, we also did not really have a much look into the, the development structure and how they work, for example. That is something that we completely left out. Uh, for example, we would look at this, how they do this agile process, how that works out for them, uh, whether it's sufficient for them or not, this kind of thing. Because when buying the company, of course, you're not just buying the product there, you're also buying the people. And, and of course, people are usually very valuable, but uh, sometimes you, you need to restructure things to make them more efficient because you're not necessarily buying the most efficient process there. Development process, I mean, not business process. Okay, I, ca I can't resist asking a question myself. Um, you said you split it very clearly between like the business decisions were for the business and yours were just the technical ones. But it occurs to me that some of the value you get from software isn't down to like how complex it is or how much effort you put into making it, but it's like the intellectual property or finding the correct solution. You know, like, it took 20 years for someone to eventually come up with TimSort as being the, like, you know, heuristic algorithm that's going to be really good for sorting lists. But actually, it's only eight lines of code, and if you wanted to re-implement it and you knew which one you were doing, it wouldn't take long. So did you have any way of kind of evaluating or measuring these guys have come up with a really good solution to this and trying to come up with it again from scratch going through all the, the wrong solutions would take ages or cost lots of money. Yes, yes. We, in, in that interview session that we did, we had them uh, basically explain to us how they, how they do this, how, what the solution looks like. Um, and then we, we found that they were doing a, had a kind of clever way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the most clever way of doing things. Um, so there, there was some, some uh, um, there was some basis for improvement there, mm -hmm. and you can see that where to improve things. So that was, that was something that we found was positive, so that you can actually make it work better and scale better. Um, but we've, and we've taken that into those added values as, as percentage. So they had, we found that they had reasonably good algorithms for everything. But actually putting a value to what, what you're saying is more or less putting a value to, say, something like a patent or um, something like a, a mechanism that you come up with an idea, and that we did not do. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? I know there's one at the front from someone who's already asked a question, so we have time for one more. If someone hasn't spoken up yet, they can have a burning question answered. Otherwise, it's a familiar sounding voice, but we're very glad to have it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I maybe missed it, but uh, are y uh, is Eugenix even allowed to make an offer to the big company? Because you gained a lot of inside knowledge. Isn't that cheating if, if you redo the project now after extracting all the information from them? Well, if big company asks us, of course we can. I mean, like I just said, I mean, this big company and small company, so um, 
yes, of course, you do have these issues that you cannot take away the intellectual property of the small company and just, uh, uh, and, and just redo everything. But that's not really our decision, right? I mean, it's, if, if they want it like that and, and they ask us to do it maybe a little differently so that you don't have these issues, of course, big company has lots of lawyers and legal departments and everything, so they can make it work, which is not necessarily nice, but I mean, big companies are not necessarily nice, right? <laughs> Good, well, that takes us to quarter two and time for our last breaks. The next thing on the schedule is lightning talks at five o'clock. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> <laughs>